All right. Well, thanks for coming this morning. You guys took all my swag really fast. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> so I do have uh, some stickers left, um, and I also have AWS credits. So I'll announce that one more time at the end in case anyone trickles in here. But I want to make sure everyone that came gets those. So we're here to talk about getting your head in the cloud with AWS. Uh, my name is Jeremy, or Jeremy Mai on Twitter, and I love PHP. PHP is awesome, and that's what I do. I uh, run the Seattle PHP user group uh, up there in Seattle, where I'm from, and uh, I somehow tricked Amazon Web Services into paying me to work on an open source PHP project for them. So I work primarily on a project called the AWS SDK for PHP, which is a library of PHP HTTP clients that are used to work with the Amazon Web Services APIs. So it's been um, a fun three years there working on that, uh, getting experience with uh, many of the AWS services, and being able to come to events like this and talk to other people in the PHP community. So I'm glad to be here. Another fun fact about me is that I also like making funny faces. Believe it or not, this actually comes into play later in the presentation. So, we're here to talk about the cloud. And, uh, of course, I'm not talking about, you know, normal clouds. Uh, but I am quite familiar with those as well, being from Seattle. But, uh, to be honest, I think the clouds in Seattle look more like this. So, we're going to talk about the Amazon Web Services cloud, which, coincidentally, is also from Seattle. Started there in Seattle. But that's not really that important. So, the cloud. Just a few years ago, the cloud was, you know, often spoken with air quotes. It was the, the buzzword that everyone said, the cloud. And probably not a whole lot of people even knew what it meant. They just said, oh, well, you know, put it up in the cloud, and woo, it'll scale if you just put it up in the cloud. So I wanted to say cloud, and everyone else would be like, the cloud. I thought it was funny. <laughs> But if we want to, you know, really iron out what the cloud is, uh, this is the best definition that I've seen. The term cloud computing refers to the on-demand delivery of IT resources via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. That basically hits on every bullet point of what the cloud is and what Amazon Web Services tries to accomplish. So I have IT resources highlighted up there. What do you think that means? What are IT resources? Servers, so, uh, servers, software, memory. memory. What was the clock cycles? Clock cycles. So far, those those are all right answers. Anyone else? <laughs> Come on, storage. People power is oddly enough can still be a, an IT resource. Bandwidth. CPU cycles. CPU cycles. Bandwidth. All right. So that was a good collection that you threw out there. Those are all right. Those are all IT resources. Those are all things that are available via cloud computing, actually. Um, here was my list. I have servers. We got that. Computing nodes. Databases. Distributed queues. Push notifications. Storage. Load balancers. Content delivery networks. Cache clusters. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything, really, in the IT world can be provided as a service. And that is the goal of Amazon Web Services, is to provide a lot of those things as services with that pay-as-you-go pricing on demand. So the cool thing about AWS is we have all these services available, but they each have an API. So you can control your resources through your programs and scripts, making it extremely powerful and available to you um, no matter what you're doing. You can even do it from your PHP code directly. So... To show you how easy it is, we're going to provision a web server from PHP using the AWS SDK for PHP. That's a lot of three-letter acronyms. And we're going to talk to the Amazon EC2 API. Here's the code that does that. That's all you have to do. So let's break that down. First section here is just instantiating the client. 
So I'm doing require vendor auto load, which if you're familiar with Composer, that's the, the typical include line that you would use to load the Composer auto loader, which in turn would load the SDK. Then I'm instantiating EC2 client using its factory method and passing in an array of parameters. Most of the uh, services in AWS are regionalized uh, to different geographic locations. So this region code here is necessary to tell you know, what, what region you want to create a server in. So US East 1 is East Coast. Then we're going to create the server with the run instances method there. Now the, the way that the client objects work in the SDK is that there's a client per service and there are methods per operation and they map one to one. So I'm running the run instances method that maps directly to the run instances operation in the ETC2 service. And then the only argument you have to provide is an array of parameters and all those parameters are defined in the documentation. So in this case we're telling it an image ID and it's got a funky code there. Uh, a AMI and then blah 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 blah. <laughs> AMI stands for Amazon Machine Image. It's similar to a virtual machine image. So if you're using something like VirtualBox or um, oh, what are the other ones? VMware. VMware. Um, there, there, there's a few other than that. But they each have a type of virtual machine format that you you can load through there. And an AMI is Amazon's version of that. So you're giving it. An, an image which is going to have all the software you know pre-configured as part of that machine image so this one right here is actually a, a lamp stack with PHP 5.5 install on then the min and max count are telling EC2 how many servers you want the reason why there's a min and a max count is because um, your account might have certain limits so you might say hey I want three but at a minimum, give me two, otherwise give me an error saying that I can't get that many. So, but we're just doing one here, so I have it limited to one and one. And then there's the instance type. And there's a little code that goes with that that says M1 small. But there's, I don't know, 20 or so different options. Maybe even, I think there's probably even more than that. But that's basically, um, we have these pre-configured um, codes that represent kind of the specs of the machine. So how much memory, how much hard, uh, hard drive space, how much computing power. We have all sorts of different combinations of that where you can, you know, I want to, you know, if you don't need hard drive space, you would select one that maybe has a ton of RAM. Or if you want more computing power, you get that. And, and Or if you want a lot of storage, you can do that. Or there's ones that are in the middle. There's lots of them that you can choose from. So you can get exactly what you need. So you're not paying for all this extra memory that you don't actually want. You're just paying for the resources that you actually want as part of that host. So we run that command. We wait a few seconds, sometimes a few minutes, depending on what type of hardware you're provisioning. And that gives you a server. You've provisioned a web server out of thin air. Where do you put your credentials? Um, we'll actually cover that in a minute. Yep. There's uh, various ways. Uh, but the best ways are the ways that are auto-detected. Instead of explicitly putting them in your code, that's bad. Right. <laughs> Can you say that you need a spot instance or something? Yes, yep. So um, that created one server on demand. We could have tweaked those parameters to do more than one. Could have done however many we wanted. Um, but then there's also a bunch of parameters within that run instances operation that control their things. So you can do spot instances or reserved instances. You can attach storage volumes to give you more hard drive space. You can uh, create static IP so that same IP address is always linked to the host that you want. Uh, you can create key pairs so that you can um, SSH into your host and do things on there. You can uh, configure the firewall so only certain IPs or certain people with credentials can get on your box. So all of that is configurable through that API. And that's just Amazon EC2. That was just one operation of Amazon EC2, actually. So, uh, I mean, there, we have many other services, uh, including Amazon S3, which is probably one, the other one that most people have heard of. That's our file storage service. There's Amazon RDS, which is our relational database service. You can create 
relational databases, including MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Postgres SQL, uh, Oracle, and do things like create read replicas, um, standby slaves, and all that type of stuff, regionalized and everything. There are services like Amazon SQS, which is a dis distributed queuing uh, platform where you can queue tasks and have other hosts pull them off and do work. And uh, we can have things that are uh, even more specific, like Elastic Transcoder, which you can use to schedule transcoding jobs for uh, video and audio. And that's just five of the services. We actually have over three dozen uh, services that are available, from things like data warehousing solutions to, um, uh, let's see, what's another one on there? <laughs> um, complete workflow uh, design tool uh, services like Amazon Simple Workflow. All sorts of things that uh, cover all the different spaces within those IT resources. What's Route 53? Uh, Route 53 is our DNS uh, service. So we'll actually talk briefly about that at the end as well. Mechanical That's the people as a service. <laughs> Uh, so you can create tasks that you want, that only humans can do, and you put a bounty on them, and then uh, people can pick those up and they get paid to do them, like, like things that are hard for computers to do, like, is this a picture of a cat or a dog? Right, and then they, you can, you can design some kind of HTML form that it just sends to them and they, they do it for you. So, yeah, all sorts of stuff. And, and you know because we um, and and interestingly enough, like I think four or five of these um, were not on the list the last time I gave this presentation six months ago. So we're we're continually adding new services and new features to existing uh, services because of the pace of innovation and how fast we release new features. That's one reason why we've been able to grow and have all the customers that we do. Um, you probably recognize several of the, the names on there. And uh, you know, we provide all these, these services and APIs, but we also try to provide good tools to help consume those APIs. So you saw an example of the PHP SDK, but we also have SDKs for Java, Python, .NET, Ruby, Node, JavaScript in your browser. So you can actually talk to web services from your client side JavaScript from like a static website. Kind of cool. Uh, then also mobile devices, we have iOS and Android SDKs. We have CLI tools, PowerShell tools, plugins for IDEs. And of course there's the, the online management console. And uh, we even have an iOS app. You can like start servers, monitor them right from your phone. So kind of cool. And a lot of these projects are open source. Uh, if you go to github.com slash AWS, uh, you can see the source code for the SDKs and some of the other projects that we work on. So let's go ahead and build something. See how it's done. So we're going to build something called the Funny Face app. I told you this was coming back into play earlier. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Aha, yes. Here's the Funny Face app. It's very simple. It's just two pages. There's a page that shows the funny faces and a page for uploading funny faces. Where are my funny faces? Funny face images. There we go. Voila. <laughs> So super simple. The app is not really the focus of the presentation, but we are going to show how some of the code is done and how it communicates with the server, and then talk about the services that we can use to deploy it and host it on AWS as well. Let's see. Oh, I was also going to show you, as far as, um, as Drupal goes, there's lots of things that are already integrated with AWS. So on our AWS Marketplace, um, there's lots of third-party providers that have created these AMIs, their AMIs and virtual images, 
of uh, LAMP stacks with Drupal pre-installed and configured and ready to go. So Bitnami is a popular one. Um, Acquia uh, does stuff on AWS as well. And uh, if you look through the Drupal modules that are available, there are several that are related to uh, using the APIs from, from Drupal. Um, there's lots of things, you know, in a content management system that might be good to put in the cloud, like all the uploads and things like that. All right. Back to PowerPoint. Okay, so step one, we're going to set up our project. So the AWS SDK, the best way to work with it is through Composer, but we also provide other ways to download it. There's a zip file and a far file that contain all the dependencies. So if Composer is not your cup of tea, you can just download the whole thing and integrate it however you want. Um, the best way to do, do with Composer, you set the version. And uh, this project, actually, I'm, I'm going to use the Laravel framework to, uh, to write the application. The fact that it's Laravel is not significant in any way. I was just wanted to use a framework. I've done the same thing with Silex and a couple other things. So um, I happened to do a similar presentation at Laracon, so that's why the Laravel app is, is here. So uh, we do also provide a um, kind of a Laravel extension that uh, makes the SDK even easier to use, specifically for Laravel users. So I'm going to import the SDK and that Laravel connection layer. Uh, within Laravel, you have to configure your providers uh, after they're installed. So this is simply stuff in the Laravel framework that you would add to hook up that uh, Laravel connection to the SDK. Is anyone, is anyone a Laravel user? Cool. So. The rest of you probably don't care about this slide. So moving on. <laughs> um, so you asked about uh, credentials. So there's actually several different ways to provide credentials. Uh, you can provide them just as um, arguments when you instantiate a client. The problem is you don't want to commit your credentials into version control. That would be very bad because things on AWS cost money. So if you give your credentials away to someone else, they're probably going to use them. <laughs> um, so we, we have several different ways to um, grab credentials from your local environment, including there's uh, specific environment variables you can set. Uh, you can uh, also use, in this case, a credentials file. So if you put this file in your root directory, the SDK knows to look for that. And it's an INI file. Really easy. Just you have a profile which you can use default and then you don't have to even say what profile to use it'll just pick it up and you provide your AWS access key and secret access key right there and it'll pull that in if you are hosted on EC2 the best way to um, provide your credentials is through IAM roles which I am going to talk about uh, in a few minutes so Laravel also has a cool tool called Artisan, which is a command line tool. It's similar in purpose to probably Drush and other things, but it's specific to their framework, and they do a lot of uh, provide a lot of setup tasks. So I thought for my Laravel application, I would create one of those because it, it provided an easy way to create some setup scripts for the application. So I created a task called Funny Face Setup, and when you run it, it creates an S3 bucket that I'm going to use to store files. And it creates a DynamoDB table, which is our NoSQL uh, service, um, that's going to store the information about those images so I can pull them in on that list page. So let's look at the codes of how those things actually work. So uh, within that command, the part that is responsible for creating the S3 bucket uh, looks like this. That's using functions that are a part of the PHP SDK on the S3 client. Uh, first, there's a we have this little helper method that allows you to check, hey, does the bucket already exist? Because in S3, bucket names are actually global to the entire service. 
because they're a part, they end up being a part of the domain name, you can't have the same bucket in your account as anyone else. So it's kind of like domain names where you know everyone tries to get the coolest uh, domain name. People often squat all of the cool bucket names as well. So for uh, if you're doing any kind of test, just you can probably use unique ID and produce some random bucket name that that no one will have. Is to this bucket name is it like global for a specific region or it's global like as global as well? everywhere? Yeah. Does it persist the plugin if you shut down an instance or shut down a service? Anyone's going to back up again? Do you still keep the same bucket name? So, but so S three is is persistent. Yeah, so it it'll always be there until you tell S3 you don't want it anymore. So we check if the bucket exists. If it doesn't, we're going to go ahead and create it uh, using the create bucket. And that this is uh, one of the methods, again, that maps one-to-one -one with the API in S3. And all, we, all we're providing there is the bucket name. And then... Um, Buckets don't take very long to create. They're usually like sub-second level. But if uh, sometimes in different regions, if you're going about a different way, it can take time. So the SDK has this concept called waiters um, with the wait until method where you can actually say, hey, I want you to just you know synchronously block here until this resource is available. Um, so it pulls, waiters basically pull a resource until they're available. And they're each configured to check periodically, and depending on what type of resource is, the buckets happen really fast, so it, it checks pretty quickly. But if you're booting up EC2 instance, it'll it'll have a, a longer interval between the times that it checks. Um, and uh, but it's a really great way to handle some of the more asynchronous operations in AWS. If you're doing something where you have to create something and then immediately use it within the same script. So it's a, just a helper that we built into the SDK. So another part of that command is setting up the DynamoDB table. And, uh, and here I'm using the create table, similar, very similar to you know, what I do with the bucket. I have a dot, dot, dot there because creating a table uh, takes a little bit more work. I have some more on the next slide. And then I'm using another waiter here that waits until the table is ready. Finding a table in DynamoDB it is, a, is, a, is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's all documented. But uh, it is, since DynamoDB is a NoSQL service, you don't have to define the entire schema like you do when you're defining a MySQL table. But you do have to, you do have to define the keys. So that's what we're doing here is we're defining the attributes that we're going to use as our keys. And then we're telling it, hey, these are the keys. You have to tell it what type it is. S is a string, N is a number. And then there's two types of keys. You have a hash key and a range key. So a hash key is just like an array key. And then a range key is something that's sequential. So we're doing, um, for this particular app, I have, since I don't really care what the hash key is, I just care what the, uh, the order of those images when I uploaded them. So Time is a range key. That's the one I'm really concerned with. And I have app hash key. It's going to just be the same value every time, but you have to have a hash key in Dynamo. Because due to the NoSQL nature of how it works, it actually kind of works like a giant hash table, like a ginormous array. Out in the cloud somewhere. <laughs> and uh, also the way that Dynamo works is... Uh, an, uh, the way that it's priced and the way that you control the performance is it has some a concept called provision throughput, which is this last parameter right here. And you can basically say how many op read operations and how many write operations you want to be able to do per second. And you can turn that up really high if you want to. Or if you're not concerned about that, you can turn it down really low like I have here. If performance is a concern, Dynamo is a really cool service because you can do lots of operations. And all your data is on SSDs, which helps make it be able to operate so quickly. Okay, so we did, we did some code to just set up our resources, but let's actually look at the application. So um, 
Laravel has a routing system that's pretty straightforward. Um, so to to make our index page, and I'm not going to show you the HTML templates because that's boring. <laughs> I'm just going to show you the, the the code that gives the data to the templates. So there's a route uh, slash, which is the index page. And I create a view and I pass in this information. So um, the funny face records, I have a separate class that's going to produce those. So that looks like this, the latest method. I'm going to get my Dynamo client from the Laravel service provider. And then I'm going to use uh, the query operation. But instead of calling the query op operation directly like client query, I'm using this other method called get iterator for query. And this is a, a helper function we have built into the SDK as well. Um, and the purpose of that is, is uh, because there's a lot of operations in AWS that are paginated in nature. So um, like for, S, for S3, for example, if you have a bucket full of objects, you can only get back a thousand at a time. But if you have more than 1,000, you have to make follow-up requests. And the previous request will give you a token or some kind of marker value that you have to put in your next request uh, to get the next page of results. Um, so I've written that by hand so many times before I, the most recent version of the SDK that I'm like, there's no way I want to do that anymore. And I don't really want to make anyone else do that either. So <laughs> we created these iterators that handle all that stuff for you. So you can just use the get iterator function and all of that passing of markers and tokens, uh, it, you don't even have to worry about it at all. It just does it all for you. You just for each over the iterator object that gets returned or iterator over any other way you want to. And if it has to go get another page of results, it'll just do it transparently for you. But it does it lazily. So it doesn't try to get everything at once. It just gets it as soon as you need that particular next page. So I think I had, yeah, here's the, this is the previous slide, but the uh, query operation requires the table name. And I'm passing a few other parameters in here. I don't really want to get in the details of the query method because we could spend more time on that. It's not really that important. Just that we're using that method to uh, get the information uh, then for the the upload page, that one is pretty straightforward because it's just a form. I don't have to get any data when I first display it. But when it's posted back, I have some code that um, will extract the information from the form, getting the caption, getting the photo information. And then I have this, um, the highlighted file right here is using a function uh, to do all the work of uploading. So this is what that function does. So first part is going to get that image uploaded to S3. So it gets an S3 client. It uses the put object method, which corresponds to the put object API. I tell it the bucket, which is that global name. I tell it the key, uh, which is going to be the path to the object. So keys... Um, a lot of people treat S3 as like a file system. It's not really a file system. It's really more like an array. So a key can have slashes in it, and most uh, user interfaces that you click around with dealing with S3 will present that as a file system to you. But it's really just your, your path or your key is really just any string of characters that you want. If you put slashes in it, then it will kind of behave like a file system. So we're passing the file name uh, to key, where the body parameter actually represent, represents the body content. So we, we're just opening a file handle to that file that got uploaded, which is probably in a temporary location currently. And we're just sending that file, file handle into the SDK, and the SDK knows how to stream that data for you to, the, to S3. Then we're also seeing um, ACL access control list. We want this to be publicly readable. By default, every, anything you upload to S3 is, is private. Um, so you set a flag here. 
to make it public because we want it to actually show up on the web page when we look at it. And that'll return uh, back with the object URL. Then we want to make a record in DynamoDB that contains that URL and the caption so we know how to load that up when we display our, uh, the index page. So here we're getting a Dynamo client using the put item operation, which again maps to the put item operation on the service. Tell the table name, then we define the item. So we have app and time, which we define as our keys, but then we can put any other arbitrary information we want because it's a NoSQL database. So we're just going to throw the URL and the caption on there, and it'll be there when we uh, reference that item again. Does anyone have any questions about that so far? It's not too hard, right? So, we gotta deploy this somewhere. We don't wanna keep this awesome application on our local host, right? I wanna see some funny faces. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna use a service called AWS Elastic Beanstalk to deploy this application. Now, um, we talked about AWS EC2 as being our, you know, our host or server provider service. Elastic Beanstalk is more of like a platform as a service solution. It uses EC2 and a few other services to create a more complete solution that's easier to use. Then we're going to use um, AWS IAM or Identity and Access Management um, to uh, help us get our credentials onto our hosts. So Elastic Beanstalk, uh, like I said, it's made up of a bunch of the other existing AWS services, including uh, CloudFormation, which it uses to create a template of the architecture, basically. Uh, uses EC2, which is the next one. Uh, I should have labeled these, I guess. All right. <laughs> Um, uses S3 to store the application tarball. Uh, this one down here is SNS, Simple Notification Service. That's uh, our um, basically push notification related service. So it uses that to communicate with the various other services uh, as it's managing the deployment of your application. Elastic Load Balancer. So we're going to be able to load balance this application uh, so that we can deploy this on multiple hosts and the load balancer uh, that's the one that gets hit when you go to the URL and then it decides hey which server is the least busy or which and and redirects you to that so you can have multiple hosts under here and then auto scaling and that's going to work in conjunction with the elastic load balancer and EC2 service uh, you can configure that to say hey you know if I at any time uh, if 80% of my CPU is used up on my existing host, go ahead and create another one for me automatically and add it under my load balancer. And then if, you know, I, my traffic goes down and I'm using 20, you know, less than 20% of my CPU on all my hosts, go ahead and just get rid of some of those instances so I don't have to pay for them anymore. So EC2... ELB and all scaling, those three together allow you to scale up and scale down based on your traffic or any other parameters that you want to configure on there. And that's what's going to make this application scalable. Using Elastic Beanstalk is the easiest is one of the easiest ways to have that all managed for you. So Elastic Beanstalk just creates and manages this stuff on your behalf. So if this is like, you know, your first time using AWS, you probably want to try Elastic Beanstalk. If you're a pro and you want to, you know, really dive in there and configure things exactly how you want it, then you can use these services individually by themselves, too. Okay, I mentioned the Identity and Access Management Service. So when we're creating our Elastic Beanstalk application, uh, we can create what's called an IAM role. And this is basically um, a policy that says, hey, I want this AWS user that uses these uh, credentials to only be able to do these particular things with my AWS resources. And it creates like a kind of a fake user that's scoped to just doing those things. So in our case, our application um, 
looks at buckets, it uploads to buckets, it creates tables, it reads tables, and there's very there's different um, there's those options are available as when you're building the role to just say I want to do those things. So we're going to create we would create a role that's just scoped to our application that enables only the operations that we're using, and that becomes our our AWS user for our application that's named by this role. And this the there basically what happens on your Elastic Beanstalk application is um, credentials get deployed to all of your hosts automatically that are scoped to the role. And that way, and the SDK knows how to get extract those uh, credentials from the environment. So the SDK will just automatically work on Elastic Beanstalk with this role defined without you providing any credentials at all. It all is managed through here. And if and it's really great security policy for if for some reason somehow somebody compromised this application or one of the hosts, they only have the ability to run the operations that are scoped to this role. So they can't start messing with anything else. That's a really good security model to use this type of um, access for your SDK and application. Before you leave that. Does this have an SDK? Yes, yep. All the services have an API. All the APIs are covered by the SDKs. So you can create roles uh, through the SDK too. Uh, to deploy your, your Elastic Beanstalk application, there's a command line tool that makes it pretty easy. You download it, you type EB init within your directory of your project, it asks you a series of questions like three or four questions to configure itself. Then you can say EB start, which will go and tell Elastic Beanstalk, hey, create this, app, this environment. And then uh, use git AWS push. That pushes the current commit of your, your uh, project to Elastic Beanstalk. It creates a deployment, launches your application. Now, if you don't like to use command line tools, which sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't feel like it, <laughs> then you can, of course, do this through the management console just by uploading a zip of your application. It'll do all the same thing for you. I mean, basically, the management console is just the user interface over the same APIs that the command line tools and the SDK uses. And then you can use the SDK to do it if you wanted to. There's the create environment, create application, create application version methods in the Elastic Beanstalk client that do the same exact things. So there's, it's, it's an API, so you, you can use it any number of ways. So we created this app, we deployed it to Elastic Beanstalk. What does the architecture actually look like you know, from a high level view? Basically, we have something that looks like this. You have a user that enters the application through the domain name, which goes to our Elastic Load Balancer. It, and again, everything's managed by your Elastic Beanstalk uh, application here. The Load Balancer forwards the, the user to one of the EC2 instances that are part of the auto-scaling group. So you can start out with one, and then you can scale up to however many you want. Uh, a cool thing about Elastic Beanstalk is if you're really just trying to test something um, and you don't want to create a, a separate load balancer from your EC2 instance, you can actually elect to do a combined thing. So it'll install the load balancing software on the same EC2 instance and save you money when you're testing because so you, you're not paying for the load balancer separately. And then all you have to do is go in there and uncheck the box and it'll redeploy as separate again when you're ready to go production. And then we're, of course, from application, we're talking to DynamoDB and also S3 to store our images. And then our images, since they're on S3, we're serving them directly from there so that doesn't take any of our server resources either. Any questions about that? I think it's pretty cool. You guys think it's cool? Yeah. I mean, it's a trivial application, but basically, if I configured this to scale up to a certain level, I mean, I could have millions and millions of visitors, and it would be fine. 
just out of curiosity, um, if you take this configuration that you, you know, the, the all of the services you, you've, um, you've defined uh, and set it up and ran it for an hour, what would be the approximate cost of that? That is a good question that I have no way of answering. <laughs> so, um, it depends on the configuration. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I think... Um, oh, this. So, let's see. If I had to guess, it worth, there was one server, and the load balancer was separate, and I had you know, low provision throughput for Dynamo, I would guess that it would probably be around like 30 bucks uh, a month. That's, that would be my guess. Don't quote me on that one, though. Uh, Wait, uh, crap, this is recorded. <laughs> curious about order of magnitude. So that would be your runner for an hour. That's for a month. For a whole month? Yeah. yeah. Say 30, 50. Yeah. So, and there, to, to help you price things out, uh, there is actually a very comprehensive uh, resource calculator on the AWS website. So if you're, and then also the product pages for these services. Like if you go to the Elastic Beanstalk homepage, it'll probably give you a much more accurate estimate to the cent of a basic um, setup. So I would, I would encourage you to go to the AWS website and, and kind of look through those pages because they're going to provide the most accurate pricing information for sure. So good question, and and I'm very bad at answering that question. <laughs> So uh, what else could we do uh, to add to this application? Well, there's lots of different things we could do because there's lots of other services we can integrate if we wanted to. Um, but I think uh, two of the most common things that uh, especially PHP developers are interested in doing is uh, using Route 53 in CloudFront. Um, so Route 53 is our, is our DNS service. It's similar to all the other DNS lookup services out there, uh, but it is globally distributed. There's uh, edge locations around the whole world, so you can get some really good DNS lookup time. And that's actually one of, often one of the most um, overlooked optimization set, uh, steps that people don't do uh, with their applications is that DNS lookup time actually can take some time. So um, Ref3 is a good way to do that. It's one of the most popular ones that are out there right now. Um, and recently, they also added some other features to Raft T. Like you can actually register domain names through your AWS console now. So that's something they added like maybe a month ago. So that's brand new. So do you choose regions when you do that? No, it's global. Yep, it's automatically set up. And you can configure various parts about that. You can also configure things like failover related to it. There's there's actually a lot of different things you can set up in there that I have no idea what they do. I'm not an expert <laughs> with that. Does that mean that uh, since you can register the domain name directly through Amazon, you can do like an uh, like example.com without the www? Yes. Okay. Yep. Is, that, is that new or has that always existed? Uh, there was a time where you could not do that, yeah. but you can. Um, basically, with, with adding that, um, you could, from PHP code using the SDK and APIs, you could create a static website, deploy it to S3, register a domain name, hook it up, and do that. Create an entire website from your PHP code using the APIs. It's pretty awesome. Like, I think that's just amazing. Um, CloudFront is another really cool service. It's also a globally distributed one with edge locations, and that's mostly for it's for caching. So you can cache content both. Um, static content that's in your S3 buckets so that that can be served up a lot quicker. You can even cache dynamic websites and do a TTL on that uh, if you want to uh, speed up anything like that. And just because I'm a little slow, so you would choose an East Coast region for your S3, but because you're getting a lot of traffic from Japan, you might bring it into the Elastic Cache so that the cloud front, or the, yeah, the cloud front. Sorry, so that uh, now the and you can choose you can choose certain things to cache, or it's everything in your. The, there's data. there's control over it, but most of the time you would want to just say, "Here's my bucket. Put the cloud front distribution in front of my bucket, and then you just use the cloud front domain instead of your S3 domain." 
and the key will just be the same thing. It just routes through so it for you. Changes I'm dropping into my own pocket, yep. and it's just going to wherever it needs to go. Yep, and then uh, if you like make a bunch of changes that you want people to see right away, you can tell CloudFront, hey, invalidate the cache and go back and get the fresh stuff. Or you can do always do you know the hack where you add a query string at the end of your. <laughs> Is it a push or a pull uh, cache? Yeah, you know, in terms of rate repression, cache. You know, um, you know, I don't know. I I don't know the specifics about that. The example you gave earlier, just quickly, about uh, being the possibility of being able to pull the site uh, loaded off AWS and run it to say from PC go. Do you know done that? Oh, well, the service, the registering domains is brand new, so I haven't really talked to anyone that's done it yet. I kind of want to just build something that does it. It'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I'm not aware of anything. If I make it, I'll uh, open source it. <laughs> uh, so, this is the same picture, but I threw in Route 53 and CloudFront so you can see where those actually sit in your architecture, but those are very front facing. I mean you would just you would have your traffic B route go through those services and that would make all that speed up all of your serving of content. How long does it take one of your designers to come up with those icons? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I should ask him. They they sit uh, two cubicle sets away from me, so <laughs> I know, <laughs> but there's only so much you can do when you have 40 different things. <laughs> so nice work, everybody. You just created your funny face application. Uh, I actually do have um, the code for the application on GitHub. Um, it's under my Jeremy Amaya username. Uh, funny faces, Laravel 4, example app. Uh, this course will, is recorded, I think. Uh, should be up soon. So we are at the end of our time, but uh, is there any last minute questions? There was a lot of questions during, which I'm glad I don't like people to save all their questions to the end. So but anything else? Cool. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning because I forgot to put this on the last slide. Did you get AWS credits at uh, the beginning? I have previously, but I'd love more. Okay. So I do have credits to give to anyone who didn't get some at the beginning. I'm almost there, back at the beginning. Okay. So if you want to stay up to date with what's happening in the PHP world uh, with AWS, this is the Twitter account that you want to follow right there. So we post announcements and things about the SDK and other stuff right there. But, uh, yeah, please come up and get credits if you didn't get some at the beginning. And I also have stickers as well. Thanks, Great. Appreciate it. <laughs>